Okay, thank you very much, Marco. Um, thanks for everyone uh, for coming today. So I thought, um, you know, the purpose of today is a little bit twofold. One is to sort of just give a little bit of an overview of the organization I work for, which is called MRC Technology, but also what we do in trying to help the promotion and translation of, of research science, academic research science, um, so that it can actually have an impact um, uh, on the patient. You know, for us, we're a medical research charity, so we're very much focused on patients and, and biomedical research. And secondly, also to introduce, um, you know, the drug discovery laboratories that we have at MRCT, um, and and how we, you know, this is how we're collaborating with uh, with Marco, um, and there might be other collaborative opportunities within the institute. So to try and introduce what we can do, the model that we operate on, and, and you know how we might be able to work together. So I'll just briefly say, you know, a little bit about what we are and who we are. So MRC. Um, technology, we're a, a research um, life sciences charity. So we're based in London. Uh, we also have sites in Edinburgh and Scotland, and we have another site just outside of London, which is a laboratory facility. And our real, I guess if you had to sum us up what we try to do as an organization in one little sentence, it's that we try to bridge this gap between the academic not-for-profit sector, so the academic researchers like yourselves, and the industry sector, particularly with a focus on the pharmaceutical and biotechnology um, industries. And we try and form partnerships and build bridges between these two sectors so that the research that comes out of here can potentially be translated into new medicines, new diagnostics, new devices that will help uh, for patient benefit. Uh, we are, if, if many of you are familiar with the UK, um, you might have heard of the MRC, which is the Medical Research Council. Uh, and this is the major government funder of uh, medical research in the United Kingdom. And MRC Technology is um, a spin-out of the MRC. So we originated as the MRC, we have that heritage, but we are no longer part of the MRC. So we've become fully independent. Uh, and we retain the name, uh, but we actually work now with, with uh, academics and research groups, um, not just in the MRC, but across the UK, across Europe, and, and even across the world, um, as you'll see later. We're a, a not-for-profit, <coughs> so everything that we do is, is very much centered on the patient. Uh, we have about 140 staff, so that makes us a very large technology transfer organization. Um, and we're quite unique in that we have this drug discovery expertise that I'll spend most of the talk um, sort of focusing on. But I would emphasize that we also do a lot of technology transfer, that traditional te technology transfer activities. And so I'm just going to start a little bit talking about what, why we do that and how we do that. Uh, we are um, in the drug discovery expertise. We, we've been very successful. Um, so we work in, in any area of unmet medical need. We predominantly, our scientists are focused on the development of new small molecules or new therapeutic antibodies. So these are actual um, compounds or antibodies that could one day become drugs on the market. And we've had a fair degree of success for an organization of our size. So we have four drugs that we have made that are actually in the clinic treating patients today. Uh, we have another 10 of the projects we've worked on that are partnered with different pharmaceutical companies, and they're at various stages of preclinical development or clinical development. And a couple of them are fairly late stage, and we're really hopeful that they'll come onto the market too. So to, to sort of start, you know, this is, I think, where we, we really see technology transfer as an as a, as a industry and as a, as a service. Um, and I, I, I don't know how many of you are really familiar with what technology transfer is or why it exists, but it really, you know, it's really there to help bridge what we call the development gap. I don't know if many people have heard this concept of the valley of death. It's something that uh, really, it's, it's about this gap between academic research, what happens in academic research, and what happens in industrial research and actually taking something to market. So the slide here is focused a little bit on pharmaceuticals. 
But this can apply equally whether you're working on a device or whether you're working on a diagnostic or whether you're working on a reagent or a tool or you, whether you're working on a new platform technology. It's sort of the same principles apply across the board. And that is that in academia, you are doing the early stage research. You're funded predominantly by government sources or from uh, foundations or charities. Uh, and you, the aim of what you do is to understand biology, understand new mechanisms, and your principal output is publications. So through doing that activity, you quite often will stumble upon new mechanisms, new pathways, new targets, uh, new diagnostic signatures um, that could have a potential commercial application or you could have an impact on the patient or could be translated in some way. And so you sit here and you want to do that in some, in some fashion. Um, the problem is that academics are very, um, I think, not very good at then doing that further development work and don't really appreciate that the actual stage that you have when you do that research, when you're in an in a academic research lab and you're at a bench and you're doing something in, in a six well plate or a 12 well plate or even a 96 well plate, it isn't, it isn't industrialized, it isn't, hasn't been validated enough, it hasn't been um, sufficiently um, uh, validated to get to the point where an industrial partner might be interested. Because the industry sits on this side and they want to take into projects um, that they have some confidence in, that have been de-risked by some degree. Um, and the problem is that they view what comes out of academia as a very high risk, not very reproducible. Often it's at the cutting edge. No, you, know, you, might, you might be the first person in the world to have done what you've done. That's really exciting. But from the industry point of view, that makes it incredibly risky. So they don't like to see that. They want to see something that they have some confidence in. If they're going to invest a lot of money in the further development, they want to have that confidence. And it used to be that you know, industry would invest in this area. Um, and you know, pharmaceutical companies used to have big R&D facilities. They employed lots of scientists. Um, but this isn't the case anymore. So over the past two decades, the pharma industry has downsized They've shed a lot of their scientists and they now concentrate predominantly on doing the late stage preclinical development of drugs and then clinical trials and then marketing and distribution. Pharma companies are the best place to do clinical trials, especially phase three clinical trials because they cost a lot of money. They're the best place to do marketing and distribution of new drugs on the market. And so again, it's very similar across other industries um, in this sector. Um, so they've, they've pulled out of this. And so now there's this big gap. And so we call this gap the valley of death because this is where really great technologies die because there's no investment, there's no further development. So from the academic side, you don't progress it because you can't get the funding or you don't know how to take it forward. From the industry side, they view it as too risky. And so, so you sit down here and, and basically many, many technologies just sit there. Some of them have patents on them, some of them don't, um, but they don't get developed, they don't get translated, and ultimately they don't ever reach to a point where they could have an impact on the patient. So this is why technology transfer exists, and this is what we try to do. Um, MRCT is a technology transfer company. Um, many universities have technology transfer companies associated with them, uh, and the purpose is really to, to de-risk technology, to build these bridges um, so that you can take the academic research, develop it to a point where it's sufficiently de-risked, where you have that proof of concept, where you have that validation, where suddenly the industry is like, okay, I have enough confidence in this that I'm willing to, to invest in this um, and hopefully take it in, into the market. And so this is, this is the function that, that we do. Um, we do this Predominantly today, I'm going to just talk about drug discovery and pharmaceutical development. We also have a diagnostics facility, and we do the same thing for diagnostics. Uh, and we don't really do a lot in terms of devices ourselves, but you know we, we have worked in a lot of that space, and I've worked on devices in the past as well. So it applies very consistently across different types of technology areas. Um, so 
I, I think there are some students and, and postdocs in the room, and so partly I was also asked by Marco to say, you know, why, you know, why do technology transfer, and, and is this a potential um, career path, or is this something that you could potentially get into, and why would I do it? You know, why, why did I? I used to be a, a postdoc bench scientist, and so I, I left research um, for, you know, I, I think I reached a point myself where I felt like I didn't want to stay at the bench. I didn't really see myself in an academic career. Um, and I was searching for what else I could potentially do. And so I stumbled upon, uh, upon technology transfer a few years ago. And this, this is my list of what, why I think it's a really interesting job and why it's a really uh, the sort of job that offers a lot of potential if you want to develop your skills in career. So I think one of, the, one of the reasons is that you get to work in a lot of different scientific areas. I was, you know, as a student and a postdoc, you were very focused, very narrow, working in a particular field, be it developing a lot of speciality and, and expertise in that field. But I sort of felt like I was missing out on a lot of other aspects of science that when I was doing my undergraduate, I was really excited by. I loved you know, learning about different parts of science. And so now working in tech transfer, I get to work in a whole range of different you know, areas of science, um, different disease areas, different indications, different technologies. And I also get to work with some really top level scientists. So you know, you're talking to people who are at the top of the field, who are publishing a lot of really high impact papers, uh, and at the same time developing these technologies. And you're working very closely with them to develop their, their research and translate their research. I think it suits people who want to do lots of different things at the same time. So I have a portfolio, or when I was, especially when I was doing tech transfer a lot, I had a portfolio of, of 20 projects or 30 projects. They were all at different stages of development. They were all in different areas. And every day was very different. So there's a lot of variety in the job. Um, and you know, I think it suits someone if you, if you like that sort of generalist approach and you really like science and helping to make an impact on science. You know, I think it's, it's an area where you can really have a big impact on developing something outside of just doing research, you actually can make a product or make something that reaches the market or actually has a potential to uh, impact on patients and improve patient health. Um, and, and I guess you, you, the other thing is you develop a lot of skills. It's a very multifaceted job. You have to do a lot of things in a lot of different areas. And um, you can then explore what, what interests you. So you can do track transfer for a while and some people, they they do intellectual property and patents because you have to file patents. You have to know what's patentable. You have to do due diligence and then help with the, you know, advising and engaging with patent attorneys to draft the patent applications. Some people really like that. Um, and they end up then leaving tech transfer and moving and becoming a patent lawyer. Um, you can, you know, these are the, some of the, the skills that you sort of develop. And it, that, you know, you do things, you get a lot of experience doing legal agreements, doing marketing of technologies communications, uh, applying for grant applications and helping advise on the translational grant applications. Um, I was doing project management of particular proof of concept projects where you, you brought in money, you had a, you know had milestones you were trying to develop. Uh, in my case, it was a new software device. Um, and you know I had to manage you know, the scientist, I had, had to manage a software company. So you can develop a lot of skills around that. You do commercial negotiations, so you actually do license deals and commercial deals, and so you sit at the table and you have to, you know, do those um, those sorts of negotiations. You can get really involved in the formation of companies, um, and you're really on the cutting edge of science. So I think it's a it's a really interesting area, and for those of you who are who are students or you might not be wondering if you you want to pursue a, an academic career and wondering what other types of opportunities or options there might be out there. I think you know, this is something that you could potentially consider. Um, there's lots of now training courses available that help you give those, develop those initial skills and, and you know, give you a taste for the types, of, um, the types of work that you do in the job. So if any of you have questions um, you know, around that, especially the students um, or postdocs, please come up to me after the talk. I'd be very happy to have a little um, chat with you about that. So I'm going to now move on to you know a little bit more about our drug discovery. Um, this is probably repeating a little bit about what I just said, but you know the philosophy of MRC technology as, as, a, as a drug discovery organization, everything we do, everything is focused on the patient. The patient is the 
is the, the focus of what we do. Um, and it's the focus of what a lot of you in the room will be doing as well. You know, you might be working on a particular disease pathway or a particular mechanism or a particular protein, and it might seem very disconnected and distant, but actually, you know, part of the reason you have your funding and part of the reason you're doing this is because there's some underlying pathology related to that particular mechanism that, you know, is, is something that's worth exploring. And out of that research, you can identify potential new pathways or targets that might be amenable to drug discovery. And as I said, this is where a lot of it stops because you hit the valley of death. Um, and also academic groups tend to not have a lot of the, the resources or the infrastructure to do drug discovery. They don't have you know, the robotics or they don't have the capability to do assay development to develop a high throughput assay. They don't have access to the screening libraries or the medicinal chemistry resources. They often, even if you had that access, you might not have the funding to do all that because you're funded to do research, not to do development. Uh, you might not have an interest in doing it because, you know, at the end of the day, this is very process driven rather than looking at the biology and, you know, you're excited by doing new biology, not necessarily by doing drug development, which is, um, it can be quite um, boring to be honest. Um, so, so this is where we really see ourselves fitting into the picture. So MRCT, I, I said we have labs, we have labs outside of London. We have about 70 scientists in those labs, and those scientists are dedicated to do drug discovery. Many of them come from pharmaceutical industry backgrounds. They have been in that industry. They know how to do those projects. And so we do projects in collaboration with academic research groups. So everything we do is a collaboration. We don't have the expertise in every disease area. We don't have the expertise in every type of target class. So we have the expertise in doing process-driven drug discovery. Um, so we collaborate with academic researchers who have that expertise in the biology, who have that expertise in the target, and together we work together and, and develop these new, um, new assets, new potential compounds or antibodies that could be drugs. Uh, we get them to a proof of concept stage, uh, and then you know, the model that we work on is to license them to pharma. And the reason we do that is that Clinical trials are very expensive, uh, and we're not set up really to do clinical trials. So what we aim to do in, in, in by working together is de-risk the asset by developing these new drugs to a point where a pharma company will, will want to license it and do the clinical development. They take it into the clinic and eventually to the market, and when it reaches the market, it obviously has an impact on the patient, and we complete the circle. So that's the the general philosophy, I'd say, of what MRC technology is trying to, to achieve. And as I said, at the heart of all this is collaboration. We are, not, we are not trying to license something from academic researchers. We don't, we don't license things. We work in a collaborative research project where we both work together. We are worldwide, um, and I'll come to that later on as well, but yes, we. We work um, with academic groups um, across the world. Uh, we've had, uh, in addition to the project with Marco, we have another project with a researcher in Rome. We have um, several projects in Germany. We have projects in Spain. We have several in the US. We have a couple in China. So we, we, we work very much on a global setting. Our philosophy is that we, the impact on the patient, it doesn't matter where the research is done, um, you know, the impact on the patient will be global. So we're looking for the best science where, wherever that science is. So the, the labs that, that I said we have, we, we call them the Center for Therapeutics Discovery. And this is the, the sort of the bit that we do and we contribute to. So for those who are unfamiliar, assay development is when you develop a biochemical assay or a cell-based screening assay for um, for assessing whether a particular compound will inhibit or um, agonize and activate a particular pathway or compound or, or um, target molecule. Um, we then do hit generation, and what this means is doing a high throughput screen or a low throughput screen, um, and uh, running basically tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of compounds through the assay we've developed so that we can find compounds that actually have an activity. Uh, and so those compounds that have activity are called hits. Those hits are then 
confirmed in secondary assays. We would like to look at things like do they hit um, other members of the same uh, uh, pathway or family. So we'd look at selectivity. We'd look at whether they hit the same um, molecule that comes from different animals. So can you have a rodent and the human that you also have activity against, which is important because you often need to do um, animal studies as you progress the project through um, clinical development. So we, we generate our hits and then from those hits we then do um, uh, initial chemistry. So that means modifying those hit compounds in different ways through to try and improve their potency but also improve their other physicochemical properties. So making them look more like a proper drug that when you take it you could actually have an effect um, in vivo. So we'll be looking at things about solubility, about how lipophilic it is, um, what's its microsomal stability, so that means how quickly would it be predicted to turn over. Uh, and uh, together we, we sort of, there's a, a whole bunch of criteria that we look at and we try and change the structure in different ways to try and help us understand what that will, what will improve the properties. And then lead optimization is very much along the same lines. We just do more and more chemistry. And then we feed those compounds usually back to the academic researcher and they're running them through different cell models or animal um, experiments. Um, so that's sort of a, so a sort of nutshell of what we do. Um, th these are some of the capabilities. As I said, we have the robotics for screening. We have a lot of compound libraries that we've developed in-house that are very high quality. We have a lot of this rational drug design. So by this I mean we use structural biology to get the structures of our um, target molecules and then we can do a lot of different things. We can do in silico um, drug screening. So you basically get um, hypothetical algorithms to try and see what types of structures would dock into the into the structures. You could do fragment-based screening um, where you run small fragments um, over these um, uh, molecules in an NMR setting. Um, you can do rational drug designs. So you make changes based on what you think the structure it is. So you can, maybe you want it to interact with a particular amino acid um, or sort of loop around different parts. So you, we use a lot of in silico chemistry to, to guide our, our lead identification, lead optimization. Um, I haven't mentioned much about the antibody generation, but this is a big part of what we do. We, we do antibody immunizations and then humanize the antibodies, do affinity maturation to improve the affinities. We really aim to generate um, clinical grade antibodies that can go directly into a person. So these are just like the capabilities that we have um, in a sort of summary. Uh, and the point is that you'll see that we don't have the biology expertise. And again, just to emphasize, the biology expertise comes from the academic collaborators that we have. Uh, what all this is is the sort of process drug discovery stuff that you probably don't have access to or you can't really access to too easily. And just to emphasize that we, we do have success, we've had a number of drugs on the market. Um, you know, we have uh, in, a, in a variety of different disease indications um, and they're all marketed by, by large pharma companies. Um, this one here, Tysabri, has been um, on the market for a number of years now. Um, it's a drug for multiple sclerosis. Um, and uh, this one here is, uh, is a really big one. So this is, um, it's a drug called Keytruda. It's only been released in the past couple of years. And it's an immune checkpoint inhibitor drug. So any of you in the room who have um, worked in the field of oncology research will probably have heard of, of immuno-oncology, which is a very new paradigm for treating cancers. And uh, this drug is, is the first in class of this new modality. And, and what it does essentially is it, it breaks the, so it, tumor cells induce a tolerance to the immune system. So they, they, the tumors become masked, so they're not actually seen. And what this drug does is that it breaks that tolerance so that suddenly the tumors can be seen by the immune system and get attacked by the immune system. So it, it's, a, it's a very new paradigm and it's something that has really changed the way that cancer has been treated in the past year or so and that will be treated in the future. We were, um, we were at a conference, the, a major American conference um, called AACR, American Association of Cancer Research. And it's quite striking that today all of the pharma companies without fail, they're doing all of their research 
on all of their drugs in the context of immuno-oncology. So instead of doing a combination, you traditionally did a combination therapy with a chemotherapeutic like cisplatin or doxorubicin or something like this. So you do a combination of that with your new drug and then see if you had a good effect. Today, no one is doing combinations with chemotherapeutics. They're all doing it with immuno-oncology. So it's really changed the paradigm. Um, and you know, this for us will generate a lot of revenue and all of that revenue will get reinvested back into further drug discovery projects. So what we're looking for and what you know, I really wanna be here today is to say, we're looking for the next k -Truder. We're looking for the next drug that will change the paradigm of how a particular disease is treated. Uh, and you know, hopefully you know, somewhere in ICGEB there might be that sort of project. Um, and for us, uh, though, as I said, everything comes back to the patient. We might generate a lot of money from Keytruda. We've generated a lot of money from Tysabri, but the impact of this is really coming down to the, the way that you treat. So Tysabri is treated probably, this is old numbers, probably several hundred thousand patients now who have multiple sclerosis. And you know, we've actually brought those, some of those patients in to, to visit us, and it's extremely powerful when you see a patient who's been treated by a drug when you know, someone in the room actually made that drug. Um, and it's, it's, a really, uh, it's, it's quite emotional for the people who work at MRCT to have that interaction. But also to say like, you can, you can, when you're an academic researcher and you're in a building like this and you're at your research bench and you're pipetting away or, or you're in a tissue culture hood, you seem very distant from a patient. And it is a long way from the patient. But I just want to emphasize it is possible to be involved in those sorts of projects where what you do can have that sort of impact and can actually um, end up um, doing something that can actually help people. And so we always keep that at the core of what we do. So I, um, I thought I'd just give a couple of uh, case studies just to give you a taster of the types of projects that we look at, but more about the type of evidence and data that we want to see when we want to do a collaborative project. So when we look at a target as a new potential target, how do we, how do we judge and assess that it's a high quality target? So this is a, <coughs> this is a target called transglutaminase 2. Um, this is a project that we did in collaboration with Tim Johnson at the University of Sheffield in England. Um, and he is a clinician scientist and his speciality was kidney fibrosis. Uh, and the transglutaminase is a very interesting um, enzyme because it is secreted, and in the extracellular matrix, it um, basically acts to cross-link collagen. And so it's, um, it was thought to play a key role in fibrosis. Uh, and Tim came to us with two lines of evidence that supported the role of TG2 as a potential target for, for kidney fibrosis. The first, um, so this is a knockout animal model. So um, you have a wild type, you have a knockout animal, um, you have a normal situation, and, and this is a, a ureteral obstructive injury model where you just basically block the, the ureter and basically this induces uh, a, a sort of a damage into the kidney and then you have following um, a fibrosis response. And you see very easily here, this is collagen-3 immunofluorescence, that in the normal setting, when you do this injury model, you essentially get a fibrotic response. You get cross-linking of the extracellular matrix. But when you knock out the enzyme, you basically lose this activity. So suggesting that TG2 is involved in this cross-linking. The second line of evidence was using a pharmacological inhibitor. So transglutaminase 2 is an enzyme, and as an enzyme, there are, there are compounds out there that block its activity. And so this one is a, um, it's a surgical model um, where it's a, it's a rat nephrectomy model where you basically do an incision in the kidney of a rat, and then you treat with this um, um, inhibitor compound, and basically in the untreated animal, you have a fibrotic um, histology, and this is creatinine clearance, which is a measure of the function of the kidney, um, is impaired. Whereas if you block the transglutaminase, you basically restore. You block this fibrosis response and you restore the creatinine clearance. So 
they have two different lines of evidence, genetic and pharmacological, implicating TG2. So you might ask the question, well, if there's an inhibitor, why didn't we do a small, you know, why don't you just make another inhibitor or why don't you use that inhibitor? And the reason is that the transglutaminase 2 is part of a large family of transglutaminases and the active site of this family is highly conserved. So it's very difficult to get a molecule that will hit the transglutaminase 2 without hitting the other transglutaminases. And because of that, none of the, um, and if you hit the other tra transglutaminases, you get um, a, a, a side effect profile that's toxic. So actually, you can't use a pharmacological inhibitor because you can't get a selective compound. However, because it's extracellular, we thought that we could develop an antibody that would target the TG2. And this is what we did. So we um, immunized animals and developed a screening assay basically to identify um, inhibitory anti-TG2 antibodies. So these are antibodies that will bind to TG2 and inhibit its function. Uh, we then humanized those antibodies. And we optimized their biophysical properties, um, characterized them for the, their ability to, ability to inhibit the TG2 function. And just down the bottom here, this is just a panel of the different different antibodies that we made and their activity against a range of transglutaminases which are labeled but essentially all the big bars are TG2 and they have little activity, binding activity to the other transglutaminases and all of this panel of antibodies had inhibitory activity. So this is the activity of TG2 enzyme uh, in um, higher doses of the antibody. So basically we achieved what we set out to. Um, and uh, we showed this activity in cell models. And just on the cell model data, there was sufficient interest from a, a large number of pharma companies. So we didn't even go to an in vivo model with this because there was a, a lot of interest. And we actually licensed this program um, about 18 months ago now. Is it? Maybe a bit more. A couple of years ago in um, 2013. Um, and quite interestingly, the company that collaborated or licensed the technology and is now collaborating with the PI lab to do further validation of the data. So um, it, it's another example that you're working in this project, you actually got an industrial collaboration with that pharma company bringing funding into the lab. This um, an antibody is due to go into um, phase one clinical trials um, later this year. So we're quite excited that this could be a, a nice um, project in the future. I'll mention a small molecule project now. So this is a a small molecule um, called Tresk. It's a non-voltage gated ion channel. Uh, and this comes to us from another cl clinician scientist at the University of Oxford. And he studied families with migraines. And he found one particular family that had a history in the familial um, migraines. Um, and in assessing that family, he found that they had a dominant negative loss of function mutation in this ion channel called Tresk. So that was really powerful evidence. You have a human genetic linkage, an actual mutation in a human that gives you a particular phenotype in migration, in migraine. He then followed this up by doing a couple of rat models, um, both where he had a gain of function and a loss of function model. And both of those also supported the, the hypothesis that Tresk was involved in um, both migraine but also in neuropathic pain. And that actually, if you were to activate this ion channel, you would reduce neuropathic pain. Uh, so we thought, we thought this was a particularly nice project to um, do as a small molecule project, looking for activators or openers of the ion channel. So what we've done um, to date is we've done um, assay development and screening. So the assay development took a, a bit of time to develop. We ended up um, doing a, a potassium ion channel assay called Fluxor, where essentially you have a dye in the intracellular compartment and you have um, uh, thallium in the extracellular compartment and then you run your compounds and the compounds that open the ion channel, so this is Tresk, then the, the thallium will move into the intracellular compartment where the thallium will interact with the dye and have a signal. So it's a very simple assay. Um, we did a pilot screen with a group of compounds from the FDA. So these are approved compounds from the FDA that have um, known pharmacology. Um, and we identified that actually one of these, called coxiquin, 
um, was a novel Tresk activator. Now, cloxiquin is a topical antibiotic. We don't know why it would open Tresk, but it was quite interesting that we were able to validate this in, in downstream assays, um, and essentially we've now published this information. So, you know, again, working on these projects, we can generate tool compounds. So this is now used in the, in the laboratory as a tool compound to explore the biology and the pathways. And, and this has lead, led to publications. And we, we also actively encourage publications of the results of what we do. So this was a pilot screen. We have followed that up with a larger um, high throughput screen using a very specialized library for ion channels. Um, and that has resulted in some hits. Uh, and what we're doing now is we've just entered into a collaborative relationship with a pharma company where they're going to fund work in the academics lab to further develop this project. So now it's a three-way project with MRCT, with a pharma company, and with the academic researcher, and that's going to hopefully develop this um, into the next stage and identifying co new compounds. So, uh, so that's a taste of the types of of, I'll go back. This is the taste of the types of evidence that we like to see. Um, you know, things that we need to have confidence in the target. We need to have confidence in the linkage of the target to disease. We need to have confidence that modulating the target will have a therapeutic effect. And we have to know that the target is tractable to drug discovery. Um, so these are the types of questions that we're going to be asking when we assess projects, when we look at new targets that are coming out of academic labs. Um, very briefly, this is our, our current development pipeline. Um, the only take home here is that we work on a lot of different indication areas with a lot of different institutions um, uh, around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a, a bunch of other things. Marco's project isn't on here because it's a dementia consortium project. Um, so this is just our unencumbered pipeline. Uh, so there's not a lot to take home. Maybe the only thing is that we work both in really big diseases like oncology but we'll also work in rare diseases. We work in orphan diseases. We work in diseases of the developing world. So we have malaria programs. We've had TB programs. Um, this, this is a really nice um, program. It's a Chinese Academy of Sciences. It's called EV71, and it's for an indication called hand, foot, and mouth disease, which is a very rare that ha has any major problems here in the West. But in China, it results in um, uh, a lot of babies dying from this infection. It's a viral infection. Uh, so there's a market in China. There's not a market outside of China. But because there was an unmet medical need, we've um, taken on the project. Um, and this looks like a, you know, a really good project. We're just getting the last stage of preclinical data. Um, but it's already been optioned by a pharma company. So we're, we're hopeful that that will progress. Um, you know, Cushing's disease is another rare or often sort of indication, so that we do both, both um, diseases. And, and this is just a snapshot. We've done a whole range of different indications that aren't on this as well. Um, as, as I mentioned before, we, we have a global focus. Um, I'm part of a team that um, we go around to different institutions around the world um, and give these, these types of seminars to, to scientists. We have meetings with scientists. and. We are aiming always to look for projects, give feedback, and identify those projects to bring in-house. But also, where you're, we're not sure, we'll bring in a project. We have an internal review team, and they can give you feedback on you know, what the current status is. If there is um, compounds that might be in the literature, we can give you guidance on what, where those are. Because sometimes there are compounds, really nice compounds, that are buried in patents that you would never find yourselves, but we can find with our databases. And they might be useful tools to explore the biology. And we give those out for free. If you have a screening assay set up, we give our compound libraries out to academic researchers, free of charge, no strings attached. We only ask that you know if you want to collaborate further, that you would choose us as a first choice. But if you don't want to collaborate with us, that's fine. You can take it forward yourselves. We, you know, so we do various things to try and promote and help academic groups start the process, um, get along the way of this translational activity, even if it doesn't become a full-blown project that we work with. Um, and in terms of a formal process, we have a three-stage process, um, which I'll go through very briefly for, for time. But it, it essentially involves an initial triage 
uh, which is a really small, um, I think it's about four pages, the form, uh, really basic questions about the target, about the rationale, about you know, what you've done to date. Uh, and we try to turn these over really quickly. So we have, as I said, an in-house diligence team. They'll review the projects. Um, we have a meeting every two months, and then we give you a response. So it's a rapid response. You get feedback. Um, if, it's, if it's a no, if we, we turn it down, we might give you feedback that says, you know, this is a really bad project because you've chosen a transcription factor and it's intractable. You can't ever develop a, a particular molecule. Or there's a lot of competition on this pathway, so we don't think you should continue pursuing this. Or we might say, this is a really nice target. We really like it, but you don't have enough evidence that convinces us that it's a viable uh, project yet. But if you get, did this and this and came back to us, then we might consider it. And we've had a number of projects come back to us after being rejected the first time at this stage, but they came back to us six months or 12 months later with more data where they've resolved those questions. If it does make it through this first stage, we go into filter. This is like a full application, but it's not it's not like a grant, and it's really important. This is not a grant application. So we assign a project manager to the team at this point. We assign a due diligence manager to the team, and they work together with you as the academic researcher to fill in the form. So you don't do it alone. So you do it as a collaborative project to fill in this application. And it's a bit more in depth. We do a full diligence exercise. We send it out to external reviewers. Um, who are industry experts in that field or target class, with the aim is that we want to see, is this a viable project? Is there commercial potential in sense that you can get a, a if, it's, if we develop compounds or an antibody, we can partner it at the end of the day? Um, is it tractable? What's the actual project? What's the progression strategy? You know, we look at all of the aspects of the project. Um, with the aim is that these are, these are proper drug discovery projects. These are exactly what you would do in industry if you were going to do a project. So we do them to the same standard. Um, so we need to make sure we can do the project and we have, we have that confidence. The third phase, we call it feasibility. Um, I call it wet due diligence. So in this phase, we will do all of, we will reproduce some of your data. We will set up assays. Um, and the reason we reproduce data is because in our experience, most, or well, I'd say over half of academic data is not reproducible. So, um, and unfortunately, that's, that's just a simple reality. When we take an assay that's working wonderfully in the academics lab, we transfer it to our lab, it doesn't work. We investigate, we spend months trying to find out why it doesn't work, and we find out there might be contamination or there might be um, you know, some reason or the source of their protein was from one company and only that company somehow it works, and if we make it ourselves, it doesn't work, or if we source it from other companies, it doesn't work. That gives us, that really makes us worried about, is this really robust? So we're testing, is everything robust? Can we set up an assay? Do we have you know, that, that sort of confidence in the project? At this point, we'll also put in, put in place a, an agreement. So this also takes a bit of time, because agreements are always uh, annoying, and they take time to put in place, but we have to negotiate them. Um, we'll cover all the things about intellectual property and publication rights. Um, we also negotiate a revenue share up front. So the, I guess the, the point is we want both parties to know what they'd be getting out. So when we partner a project, we share the revenues back to the, to the academic as well. So we both share in the upside. Uh, and so we negotiate that up front. Um, you know, our model is, is called, we call it a risk share model. And by that I mean all of the activities that we do at MRC Technology, so all of that drug discovery work, assay development, screening, medicinal chemistry, all the external CRO costs that we use in projects, everything we do we cover at our own cost. So we take on all of that risk ourselves. What we don't do is we don't fund researchers in the labs of our collaborators. So we, so it's, we, we call it a shared risk model. So for our academic collaborators, if we need you to do it in a particular you know, set of experiments, you do it, you have to do it and cover those costs yourselves, at least for the personnel. Where it comes to things like consumables or it comes to things like animals, then we have a little bit more leeway to help with those sorts of costs. 
but we're we're actually we're not allowed to fund ac academic researchers at the at the current state. So we can't fund PhDs or postdocs or hands, but we can fund consumables and 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 animals and things like that. So that's just to bear in mind. We try never to let this stop a project going ahead. So we will always try and find a way to ensure that funding issues are not a reason for a great project not to progress. So we'll work with it, with you on how to best manage the workload if you're having really tight funding issues and you don't you have constraints on people. We'll f always find a way. So don't let that inhibit you applying if that you think that might be an issue. Um, and when a project is launched, let's get to the good point. You're part of the, you know the PI is an integral member of the project team. Marco can answer to that. You're invited to the project team meetings. You sit in the in the in the group, um, and everyone participates. And all decisions are made as that group. So we don't we're not there to take off and and lead. We're there to really um, you know be equal partners in the project. And that includes all the decisions that are being made. So really, the, the not just the PI, but the actual researchers themselves, they're, they're invited to these meetings. They present, and we, we make all those decisions about the project in those meetings, which I think is really collaborative. And, and I think, you know, hopefully from the academic side, you actually learn quite a lot about how uh, an industry standard drug discovery project would be, would be conducted. And I think that's a really good experience as well. And I, I, I think that's one of the things that Marcos has come out of his experience to date is that uh, that exposure has been really something new to him. So this date is wrong because uh, I didn't update the slide. Um, so that's, that should be um, in July. So it's the um, 7th of July is the next deadline for these applications. But I'd encourage any, any of you who might be interested to get in touch with me first. We can have a chat, send over some data and we'll give you some feedback first about whether we think it's at the right stage. So this is um, now, you know, what are we looking for? This, I'd say, is the most important slide in the talk, if you're interested, because it really comes down to, okay, this doesn't just apply for MRCT. This applies if you're thinking at all about translating your research, especially in area of pharmaceutical development or drug discovery. It's really, really important that you address all of these sorts of questions before you start to go down the path too far, no matter how you do it. The first is novelty. So what we look for is novel targets or novel, novel approaches to known targets. So by that I mean if you have a known target that's well studied but has not been developed, no drugs are on the market because there's toxicity issues or selectivity issues, and you found something in your research that has identified a, a novel way to address those problems, that, that becomes a viable project. Or if you have a completely new pathway, a new mechanism of action, this is what is gonna be high value. If you're working on, an, on a well-validated target that everyone else knows about and everyone else is working on, you know, industry will have worked on it. They've got compounds, they've got, you know, they've developed drugs already. You're not gonna be competitive from where you're sitting compared to the company and industry. So novelty is really important. And validation is, I can't overemphasize how important validation is. My experience in, across the board in technology transfer is that <laughs> academics f think that what they do is a lot more valuable and more developed than what it actually is. It doesn't matter if you've published a nature paper or a cell paper, it doesn't make, mean that what you've published is developed. It just means it's been peer reviewed. Um, and that's a different thing. We need to reproduce it. You need to actually demonstrate through several lines of evidence that a particular pathway or compound is really involved in that disease process. So we're looking for the validation, the types of things I showed in the case studies, which can include knockout data, SHRNA data, um, you know, nowadays you've got CRISPR-Cas9 technology which allows you to, to do those genetic editing experiments that give you some, some of that validation. Um, really expression studies, you know, things that associate the protein with a particular um, disease process. Um, any sort of data you can get from primary cell, primary tissues or primary cells as opposed to cell lines or from human-derived patient samples is really strong. 
um, anything you can get from pharmacological tools is really strong. Uh, that, that really shows you can actually modulate something in a in vivo context with a tool compound. That's, that's really nice data. Even if it's a really dirty compound and it might have a lot of different pharmacology or it might be really toxic or it might be insoluble, just, it just gives you confidence that you can hit the pathway potentially. Um, things like SNP associations are, you know, generally can be very helpful to support the genetic linkage of a particular pathway. Um, GWAS screens, we get a lot of targets that have been identified there, but then you have to follow it up with a functional downstream validation. Um, you, so you know, all of these, are, these are, it's not an exhaustive list here, it's just an example of the types of things that we'd be looking for. Genetic, human genetic linkage is the gold standard. If you have that, then you know, that's really strong. Um, but you know, that's sometimes quite rare to have really that, that level of quality. Um, so these other types of data we'd be looking at. Tractability is really important. So tractability means can you actually develop a drug to this particular target? So things like a kinase or a GPCR receptor, generally enzymes, these are all tractable targets. So you can, you can especially if you're aiming to inhibit them. So you can get, imagine an active site, you can, you can whack in a molecule and block the function. Iron channels, tractable targets. If you're looking for an antibody project, please make sure that it's extracellular or secreted. We actually receive project submissions for antibody projects that are intracellular. And antibodies don't go intracellular. Um, so you have, to, you have to understand where it is, where the molecule is on, in the cell, where it is in the tissue to see if you're going to be able to target it. Um, Protein-protein interactions, I'll talk about a little bit because we get a lot of protein-protein interaction submissions. This is usually where you have an association of this protein and this protein and it does something as a complex that then promotes the, a pathway and you want to inhibit that pathway by blocking that interaction. Sounds really great, but what you need to show is, is it possible to get a molecule that blocks that interaction? And that's really, you can't really tell from um, just sort of any, the sorts of evidence like mutation studies. Unless you have a single point mutation that blocks that interaction, that, that gives you evidence that a single site can potentially disrupt it. But you know, protein, proteins can interact over you know, very flat surfaces that become very difficult for a small molecule to get in there and, and break that interaction. Or they can interact over very small surfaces that you can get a molecule in there that could potentially disrupt that. So if you can get evidence, say, from a small peptide or a point mutation, um, that helps give you some sort of validation that it's a disruptable interaction. If you have structural data, it's really key. If you have the structures of those two molecules and you know where they bind to each other, then we can do so in silico modeling to see if there's a tractable site. Um, so Protein-protein interactions are very possible, but they're difficult projects, and it really depends on the evidence that we have about them. There are some things that are really bad. I mentioned before transcription factors. If you have a transcription factor, don't send it to us because it's never going to be a drug. Um, the only, only one would be the um, nuclear hormone um, translocation transcription factors because they have multiple functions. But in general, a transcription factor that binds to DNA you, you can't really develop a good drug against it selectively. Uh, so, so there are different types of targets out there and it really depends w whether they're tractable or not. And that's something that we would look at as part of our diligence. Um, we're obviously looking for ac academics who bring something to the project. So um, we're looking for someone who's done enabling assays or have reagents or tools or have a cell model or an animal model that you've used. We like to see that you've published on the target. We had an application the last round where the applicant had never worked in the disease area and had actually copied word for word bits of a paper from another academic who'd published on that disease area. So we were like, well, we're not gonna go with him, but it looks like an interesting target. So we're now gonna contact the, the guy who's, whose uh, publication he plagiarized. So, you know, obviously we're looking for, for someone, what you can bring to the, 
to the collaboration as well. Um, competitiveness, and this is something you should be thinking about if you're going to be talking about drug discovery, especially if you have um, someone commercial in the organization or institute who might have access to some sort of databases to understand what's going on in industry. So what is the current standard of treatment for your particular indication that your target's addressing? Is a drug that's going to hit your target going to be competitive with that? Is it, is it going to do the same thing? Is it going to overcome selectivity issues? Is it going to overcome side effect issues, toxicity issues? Um, you know, what is your differentiating factor going to be? And then you know, don't have to just look at the gold standard, you have to look at what's the pharma pipeline. What's coming through an industry that will, might reach the market in the next five or ten years that would be competitive to what you're doing. So if you came to us today with a, a HCV uh, project, there's no chance we're going to be doing it because HC, you know, there's a lot of treatments now for hepatitis C. If you came to us with a multiple sclerosis project, it's unlikely that it's going to get through unless you're addressing the particular form of multiple sclerosis where there's still an issue. If you come to us with a rheumatoid arthritis project, we're going to be looking at, so can you address the patient population that is currently, currently refractory to TNF alpha treatment? We'll be always looking at what is the patient group you're addressing. You know, and these days, it's, you know, patients are stratified. Disease, complex diseases are not just one pathway. There's going to be some patients who respond to this drug, other patients who respond to this drug. Can you address a patient population that doesn't have a treatment? Those would be, they're the sorts of projects that are going to be more favorably looked at. Um, and, you know, just to say, we'll take projects at any stage of the development, so don't feel that you have to have just a target. If you have a screen, great. If you have chemistry already done, great. If you have some hit compounds, great. If you have a monoclonal antibody, perfect. Come to us, whatever stage, and we'll give you that feedback and advice. Um, equally, if you have a target and you have nothing else but that target, but you've got a lot of nice validation on that target, perfect. We can do the assay development. We had a, one of probably the best projects we've brought in recently. Um, it's an antibody project but the academic had validated it solely with commercially bought antibodies. Didn't have any proprietary tools or reagents in, in terms of the antibody, but that's fine because the validation of that project was really strong. So we're now just going to be raising those antibodies through a, a CRO, and then we'll get a panel of antibodies and find the ones that, that work well. So, you know, with this, we're happy to take on projects at, at any uh, stage and in any area of unmet medical need. So. So that's um, sort of what we do. Hopefully the take home is that you know, we add value, we help you add value to your research by collaboratively you know, developing these projects to really meet unmet need um, and really de-risking new therapeutic modalities for patient benefit. Um, and we hope that you can get, you know, that working with organizations like us, we give you avenues and opportunities to, to take your research in a way that you might not have thought about before. Um, we, hopefully, I've convinced you that we have some expertise. So we've got four drugs on the market, many more in the development. But you know, the projects that we develop, we, we also aim to give you back stuff that will help in your research. This will be tool compounds and antibodies that you can use in your research and you'll have access to those. This will be publications, so we aim to publish the results of the research and then you know, hopefully that will help you. You can use the data we've generated in your grant applications to bring in more data and ultimately and hopefully encourage industrial collaborations. Bringing in those sorts of relationships with industry is really important today. The world, you know, it's a very important thing to have those collaborative relationships with industry because the world is that their industry has started to move earlier stage. They've sacked all of their R&D scientists. They've closed down all of their R&D facilities. So now they source everything from academia. And to do so, they have to develop those strong links with academic institutions. And so this is something that you know, will inc increasingly be important um, as, uh, as, you know, as, I guess, in research and bringing in different types of revenue streams in research. So thank you very much. I, I'm conscious we're over time. I was going to mention the Dementia Consortium, which is what we're involved in with Marco, but I think we probably should finish up now. So thank you very, very much for your time. Um, and happy to answer any questions you might have.